Deputy Commissioner. And we want to thank you for joining us on um, what I hear is a beautiful, sunny Friday afternoon. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is primarily a legislative uh, briefing. However, we do know that there are folks who are following this on Facebook, and we hope that the information that we provide has uh, general applicability. Um, I wanted to just start out today by saying that, um, as everyone knows, the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, that additional $600 in supplemental unemployment benefits has ended. We've been getting lots of questions for an update about what's happening. Uh, I just wanted to say up front that we do not have any information about if there is going to be an extension or what, uh, or a reinstatement at this point, or what that would look like. Um, as soon as we receive any information, we will um, pro provide that to you, and we will also put it on our website um, and do our best to comply with whatever um, is available as quickly as possible. So for today, um, there are a couple of things we wanted to go over because we have been receiving some questions, primarily about um, two programs in particular or two processes, and um, and then to answer um, answer additional questions and give you a top line overview of where we're at with processing payments. Um, in addition to the statistics that we'll be providing about where we're at um, with uh, paying benefits, we will also be doing a deeper dive into the fact-finding process and um, also into the work search requirements. So that's kind of our agenda. We'll go through a couple of slides, hopefully um, as quickly as we can, and then open it up to uh, questions from legislators. As always, you can put your questions in the chat box um, or, uh, or ask questions after we've walked through, um, through the slides. <clears throat> so we continue to, um, to process uh, claims. Um, uh, just wanted to give you some of the numbers. So between March 15th and the and roughly um, August 5th, about 155,000 people have applied for unemployment benefits, and about 96% of those have received a determination. So that means they've either received a benefit payment. About 87% of uh, people have. That's up slightly from last week. Um, or they've been approved for a benefit but not have, have not filed a weekly certification. That's that 7%. That number seems to be holding steady. It's gone down a little bit. Um, it was at 12,000 people at one point. It's about in the 11,000 person range now. Um, and about 2% of people have been determined to not be eligible. Um, about 134,000, almost 135,000 people have received at least one benefit payment. And as I said, that's up a little bit from last uh, week, about 1,400 additional people. Uh, <clears throat> the groups that we continue to focus on are that remaining 4% of people who have not received benefits. And um, the things that we are doing are uh, we continue to send letters to claimants um, who have uh, been determined to be ineligible for unemployment um, but uh, have not applied for pandemic unemployment assistance. We're using a st streamlined and expedited process to um, to uh, accelerate our fact-finding, and that's one of the things that we really want to talk about today. And we continue to refine our uh, fraud detection and recovery of, uh, of those fraudulent payments. Um, although we haven't spoken about it quite as much recently, uh, the fraud continues to be a widespread problem across the country. We continue to collaborate with other states and with the NASWA 
um, integrity hub uh, to, to get better at detecting fraud before payments are released, as well as working cooperatively to recover some of those, um, those payments that have been made. So, you know, Kim, if you want to walk us through the status of the initial claimants. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. So as you can see from the chart, just the graph, um, over the last four to six weeks that are up there, um, we have made progress. We are putting more people into payment status every week, 134,700 in that biggest blue section uh, under the August 5th column. The, the next column, of uh, the next section up, 11,200 people, and we have seen that number hold pretty steady over the last few weeks. Those are the people that have an initial claim on file but have not filed any weekly certifications. We are continuing to send weekly emails to these individuals, um, encouraging them to file their weekly certification if they're expecting to receive benefits. Moving up in that column, the next section, which is an orange color, is 3,600 people that are currently ineligible. As the commissioner said, that's roughly 2% of the applicants. The, the next one up in the, um, the, the royal blue, I guess it is, are 2,400 individuals that are flagged as potentially fraudulent. So we have sent notifications to these individuals asking them to send in I, um, documents to verify their identity so that we can put them back into pay status. That number has also held relatively steady. Um, we people uh, claimants that may be flagged each week newly, but then we have the same amount of people coming off. So there is a solid base there that um, we believe are truly fraudulent claims. And in that category too, that's one of the areas that uh, if we receive um, verification from people, ID verification, we're able to turn that around. Um, fairly quickly. Um, so again, we know that it is um, an additional hurdle for people who are genuinely um, eligible for benefits, and we apologize for that. Um, and we're trying to constantly balance that getting benefits out to eligible people as quickly as possible, and at the same time, the fiduciary responsibility that we have to make sure that we are not um, paying fraudulent claims. Um, so that's, right. that's our goal, and, and we are, um, again, trying to move through those as quickly as possible, and I think at this point in time, it's a uh, matter of a, you know, once we get the information uh, from people, and that can be uploaded on the Reemploy Me system, um, so that the, we're trying to have as many things as possible going through uh, the same system so people don't need to remember different email addresses or website addresses to make it as, um, as easy as possible to get through those processes. Right, and the link to do that is right above the login link on the Reemployme website. And the file group at the, the very top of that column, 3,300 people approximately that are in process. If we skip over to the next slide, we have a little more detail on those 3,300. Uh, the pie chart on the right-hand side, as you can see the, the bulk of them, 2,100 individuals are waiting for a fact-finding. Um, almost 900 have already been denied for state unemployment and are in the process of being rolled to the uh, PUA program. In um, last week, we sent, well, or two weeks ago, we sent letters to individuals, um, just over 560 people, encouraging them when they file their next weekly certification to answer the PUA questions. And um, so that would be included in this group as well. We, um, of those 560 odd people, have not actually had a good response there. We've about 15 to 20 percent of the people have actually filled out. Uh, answered those questions, filled out the application so that we can move them into the PUA program. So, and again, that may be because they, something else, their circumstances have right. changed and they uh, do not uh, believe that they are eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that everyone uh, who was potentially eligible had the opportunity to apply for it. Right. Um, Moving on to the next slide, this is a breakdown of the 2,100 individuals who are still waiting for a fact-finding. 
as you can see in the red section, a bulk of those are individuals who applied in July. Uh, the next biggest section is the, those that applied in June. And then what's the a much smaller sliver is um, going back to March, April, and May. Um, 10 people in March, 14 people from April, and 16 people from May. And we have instituted a, um, a SWAT team, if you will, of individuals, of adjudicators who are going through the fact findings and holding those um, fact findings, issuing decisions from the oldest to newest. And even though um, you see 10 in March, it does not necessarily mean that those are 10 people who filed in March and um, <clears throat> have been waiting since March. We're also seeing folks who may have uh, filed in March, went back to work, or, um, and are now <clears throat> un uh, unemployed again. Um, but we use the date of the initial application as the date um, that we're sorting these um, these claims by. So, uh, and that number uh, may go up or down by one or two over mm -hmm. on a on a daily basis. <clears throat> so we really wanted to go into the claims process again, and uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth about fact finding. But Kim. Sure. So I'm starting in the upper left corner, filing an initial claim. That's that's the first step. Those are all of the questions that we ask individuals about their separation or why they've become unemployed. Um, in order to become eligible for unemployment, there's a, a two-step process. The first is an assessment of someone's monetary eligibility. Uh, that happens within a few days of the initial claim. The, the monetary eligibility really is, it gets at assessing someone's connection to the workforce. That is a requirement of being eligible for state unemployment is that they be connected to the workforce. We define that as having earned a certain amount in the previous um, five full calendar quarters. So we say within the last 18 months roughly, have has the individual earned at least $1,700 in two quarters and 5600 overall in four of those five quarters. The second step of that is the, the fact-finding process itself, where we assess the, um, the reason why the individual has become unemployed. Is it an allowable reason for them to continue collecting unemployment? Um, both of those have, a, both of those decisions, the monetary eligibility as well as the fact-finding determination have appeal rights. The monetary eligibility is only appealable by the claimant, whereas the, the separation decision is appealable by either party, the individual or their employer that they separated from. And we're hearing from some people who don't understand how to file an appeal, so I think we've included some information here as well about the various ways that you can file for an appeal and on each determination, fact finding determination that someone receives, um, more specific information about filing an appeal is included, but the kind of top line is that you can again use the Reemploy Me account uh, as a um, as a as a tool for applying for, um, for filing an appeal. And if you're if you're doing that, there's two different places in your Reemploy Me account. It appears as a tab across the top of your account, as well as a link on the right hand side of the screen. You can also email an appeal in, fax it in, phone, or um, use the U.S. Postal Mail. So I didn't mean to interrupt your, your flow no, that, there. No, that was perfect, actually. Uh, and that information, as well as either the fax or the, or the telephone number, the email address, uh, or the, the mailing address, are all available in every decision. Those monetary determinations have it, as well as the deputy's decisions, we call them, which are the determinations that come out of the fact finding. All of that information is available there. Um, if, if either party appeals a decision to the Division of Administrative Hearings and then um, is still unsatisfied with that decision, then they can also appeal that decision to the Unemployment Insurance Commission, which is uh, separate from the Department of Labor, um, not um, it's a three-party um, appointed um, position that's held for uh, dates certain, um, and it represents employers. One person must re represent employers, one workers, and one neutral. And uh, 
those folks are appointed by the governor and confirmed um, by the legislature. And then there is a further appeal right if either party is not satisfied with the decision that comes out of the commission, they can appeal to the Superior Court. Uh, the, the second step in, in filing for benefits is filing those weekly certifications. We consider that almost like your timesheet. You have to fill that out in order to be paid each week. So filing the weekly certification, ask questions about your availability for work, whether um, you're able to work, those kinds of things. If there is an issue detected where we need to talk with somebody about what their answers were or what their situation is, we would hold another fact finding. And again, um, either party, usually those are just claimants, but they could be um, also two parties with the employer involved, may file an appeal of that decision. And the one thing I did want to mention about the, also the appeals to the Division of Administrative Hearings, those must be done within 15 days of the deputy's decision being issued. And that information is also on the, um, the fact-finding uh, decision. <clears throat> so because we're getting questions, um, there are a couple of things we wanted to do. We wanted to just show you um, examples of the kind of notices that people would receive and also walk you through the expedited process. Under ordinary times, um, someone would receive a, uh, a notice that would look like this and um, with a specific uh, date and time that you should be available for your fact-finding hearing, and that's um, done on the phone. Um, we would um, send this to you uh, in the mail, uh, and the information on here is fairly straightforward. Um, you're going to present information at this fact-finding hearing. Uh, if it's a single party, it may just be from the claimant. If it involves a separation, it could be the claimant and the employer as well, and each side would have an opportunity to provide information. One of the things that we're doing because, um, you know, when this back in March when the pandemic began and we were scheduling out fact findings, um, many of you were contacting us and saying these fact findings are taking too long, um, and we agree. Um, so in order to expedite it, what we are doing is we have a team of adjudicators who are going through the lists of, um, of uh, people who are waiting for fact finding, and they are contacting uh, the, um, the claimants and offering them the opportunity to waive the normal five-day waiting period and to hold the fact finding then, or if they decide that they do not want to, they're not prepared, which is understandable, we send a notice in the mail to, um, to notify them of uh, a time five days from now when the fact finding would be held. <laughs> so by going through things more quickly, um, we are hoping to, um, and it, we've been able to demonstrate that we are able to move through the fact finding process much more quickly. Uh, the other piece that's important to know, as Kim had said earlier, when you look at that chart and the process, is if somehow um, the claimant or the employer disagrees with the decision that is made based on the information that we have, then there is an appeal process. So this is not your only opportunity if you think we've gotten it wrong. Um, we, uh, I'm not sure if it's... Maybe we can go to the next page mm -hmm. to talk about the decision. So this is an example of the deputy's decision, and we wanted to put this up here because um, I think that uh, sometimes the information about fact-finding can be confusing, um, especially if we are able to make a determination without, um, based on the information that we have on hand. So on this, um, uh, this decision, it says, the highlighted part is the decision addresses an issue scheduled for a phone fact-finding on, on August 28th, and no interview will be held. We're hearing from some people who said, well, I had this fact-finding, nothing happened, 
but my benefits showed up in my account. What does that mean? This is um, one of those expedited situations where by looking at the facts that had been provided to us, the adjudicators felt that they had enough information to make a decision, went ahead, made the decision, and the person should have received a deputy's decision like this, laying out what their decision was and why no interview would be held. Um, again, at the bottom of the page, it talks about, and I don't know if you can, if we can get the whole thing on here or not, but um, what the appeal process is. So there's a short summary of um, what the issue was. There's a, um, a determination that's made, and, um, and then if the, either the claimant or the employer disagrees with it, there is the appeal that can be filed. Kim, is there anything that needs to be added to that? No, then that is actually the bottom of the page, just the bottom of the box cut off. So it gives the dates uh, within which an appeal must be filed. And on the back side of the form, which we did not put up there, are all the, the telephone numbers and addresses, the different ways that the appeal can be filed. And again, um, it, it's important to know that there are multiple ways that the appeal can be filed, but it is important that if someone disagrees with the decision that's made, um, that they file that appeal. As we had mentioned uh, last week, this is an administrative law process, and once it starts moving into that administrative law process, um, there's less flexibility around um, how how matters can be addressed. And, right. Okay. The, so the, the next topic that we wanted to bring up are the work search requirements. Starting this Sunday, some individuals who are filing for unemployment will be required to conduct work search activities and to report those activities on their weekly certification. And I think it's important to note, um, you know, why we are doing this. And uh, these, again, as Kim had said, are people who are no longer connected to their employer. So these are folks who are looking at a permanent separation from work. Um, we are seeing that, uh, you know, Maine, fortunately, because of the incredible cooperation across the state from, um, from everyone, has, a, uh, has been complying with things like wearing masks, hand washing, social distancing. So our rate of infection is very low. Businesses in the state have uh, reopened. Um, you know, people are opening uh, gradually and putting appropriate precautions in place, um, but there is um, reopening and we all want to see that continue. And so these folks who have been permanently separated from their employers, um, the, for those folks that work search requirements are being um, reinstated, which is a typical part of any uh, unemployment program, as you've heard me say many times by now, in order to be eligible for unemployment, you must be, first of all, monetarily eligible, you must have lost a job through no fault of your own, you must be able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work. And there has been flexibility around the able, available, and actively seeking work during the pandemic. And we continue to be um, to using those flexibilities. And in response um, to that, we have expanded um, what we uh, consider to be um, uh, appropriate work search activities. And so we'll talk a little bit about what what those are uh, looking like, as well as um, some of the new. Um, ways of accessing services that we now have available. I, we, there's a, a quick list there of some of the things we're looking at, including participating in virtual job fairs, virtual reemployment services, um, virtual workshops, um, in addition to any sort of in-person um, job interviews, uh, and uh, contact with, um, with employers. Uh, we are also looking at what are the kinds of 
skill development that you can be doing um, in your uh, while you're preparing to go back into the the workforce. We do know that um, that most people are anxious. Uh, to increase their skills, and we're hoping that we are um, pro providing a range of opportunities for folks to be able to do that, uh, and that they can do so safely um, and, um, and have an array of um, opportunities available to them. We had also walked through what the, uh, what the, um, the, the screenshots looked like a few weeks ago, and based on feedback that we received from you, we've made some modifications. I, I do want to say that even though the work search requirements go into place on um, August 9th, which is Sunday, the way that unemployment insurance works is you're always looking back a week, so you're eligible for benefits the week ending. So this would be, you start doing your work search, uh, you know, the week beginning, August 9th, um, but you will be reporting on um, the first opportunity you'll have to fill out uh, your work search questionnaire will be on Sunday, August 16th. So you'll be looking back for activities that you participated in from August 9th through August 15th and reporting on those activities the week August 16th through, and I'm looking sideways here because there is a calendar on the wall. And so any time after work. August 16th, would, uh, you'd be able to file for the, the week ending August 15th. And I say any time, typically there's a two week window in which you have uh, the ability to file for a certain week. And so this will show up again through the Reemploy Me account. Yep. Um, and it will come up when you're doing your weekly certification. And the first questions that you will be asked are, were you self-employed and do you plan to return to self-employment? And you either answer yes or no. And are you in contact with your previous employer about returning to, the, to work in the future? If you answer yes to um, these questions, either of these questions, then you will not see the additional work search um, activities page um, because this group of people are still covered by the work search waiver um, until uh, the governor extended the civil emergency declaration uh, and these folks are covered until 30 days after that civil emergency declaration ends. So at this point it's it's October 3rd um, that uh, these folks would be, um, uh, that the work search uh, waiver would be removed. However, if you're answering no to these questions, then the next screen that you would see is this one. And you want to walk through this one? Please? I'd be happy to. So the first question is, during the week claim, did you look for work, which includes applying for or interviewing for a job? And that's yes or no. And then the second question is, during the week claimed, did you participate in one of the following? And these are some of the things that were listed on that previous slide. Did you participate in a job fair? Did you participate in career center reemployment services or a career center workshop? Uh, did you participate in uh, some job-related skill development program? And, and you can see the things that are all listed there. I won't read through each one of them. But these are, uh, as the commissioner said, flexibilities that um, that we're, we have that we can put out there, just as we've been flexible with being able and available for work, we're being flexible with what work search activities are. Typically, it's applying and interviewing for jobs. Typically, it's that first question, or participating in specific career center events, but we've expanded it to include this list. So if you haven't done either of those, that's the third question. Uh, we're asking for a brief explanation on, on why you didn't participate in any of those activities. And so if you answer uh, one of the following and you say yes, um, there is going to be uh, where it says select over here, there is a drop down menu and you will have an opportunity to, to look basically at the same list in there and check one of them. Right. As well as if you answer yes to question one, if that question applies to you, there would be another screen. We don't have a screenshot of it, of it here, but it asks which employer uh, you sought work with. And um, 
continuing with this, uh, that all uh, one of the other things that we had not been requiring was to fill out uh, what we call a, a job link profile. I mean, basically, this is a short resume, mm -hmm. um, and that that information is included in the main job link. And the reason for that is currently we have about 12,000 jobs listed on the main job link. This would allow you to, um, to look at the jobs that are available, as well as for employers to be able to look at your resume. Um, and any um, targeted jobs that, um, that we have, for example, um, a lot of people were very interested in what are the opportunities during um, the pandemic to do work that is um, going to um, help in some way during the pandemic. Uh, there are, and so we've had a number of healthcare providers. Um, we've had companies that are manufacturing particular types of protective uh, equipment that are listing jobs with us. And so we can um, target mailings to, um, and by mailings I mean emails, um, to people about specific jobs. Also before the pandemic hit, we were identifying um, green energy jobs and other um, uh, jobs that were connected in some ways to um, uh, abating climate change. So there are a number of ways that we can uh, sort the data, and this is a great way uh, for, um, to connect people to available um, occupations in areas of interest. There is also a uh, virtual job um, link training that's being offered, and I, that's offered, I believe, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and so that if you're not really sure, how do I fill out my profile? What is it that I need to do? Um, we have a workshop specifically for that uh, that you can sign up for and um, have an opportunity to walk through that with people who are experts in um, in applying for positions and crafting these um, kinds of uh, resumes and postings. And we do have a, a video up of that uh, on the maincareercenter.gov webpage, um, but the live sessions would allow for uh, questions, live questions to be asked. And continuing uh, with the Career Center information, uh, as you all know, our Bureau of Employment Services has really been working hand in glove with our Bureau of Unemployment Compensation. Uh, and as the economy is uh, kind of re getting re-energized, our Bureau of Employment Services staff have been shifting their focus to get back to their kind of core work of employment services. And they have begun um, putting together, uh, you know, different ways of delivering these services. I mean, one of the things that I know particularly are more rural um, legislators have been asking for for a long time is if you only have 12 career centers across the state, how are my constituents supposed to be able to access services? Uh, while it's not perfect, um, having um, the option of accessing services virtually, we believe will expand, um, cut down on the need uh, for people to have to commute to services and uh, also hopefully broaden uh, broaden the um, accessibility of services to more people. Um, some of the programs that are offered are, you know, rapid response. We haven't stopped doing those. Those are happening um, virtually. They uh, do weekly job uh, blasts to people about what are the available jobs in your area. Um, they are also doing virtual one-on-one -on -one career consulting. I just bumped into a, a woman in the hall who was asking me about that, um, and not somebody who works here, um, somebody who does not work here, and saying how she would really appreciate being able to sit down with someone and think through how she interviews for jobs because she's concerned that her interviewing uh, skills are a little rusty. So. I told her about the virtual services and she was excited to hear that that was an option. Um, we're also looking at how can we provide 
different kinds. Earlier we had said about the uh, work search services being a little bit broader. Um, the Career Center, and we'll be announcing this next week, um, has an exciting new opportunity for people that will be offering um, courses online. Um, and we'll tell you more about that next week, but it's a partnership with a national uh, platform that will allow people to, be take, to take classes um, either specifically for certain occupations or um, more generally. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that next week once we've uh, finalized some of the details, but I think that will be a, a, an exciting opportunity for about 5,000 people. Uh, if they are um, interested in accessing those career training and uh, classes online. I think the other um, program that we had talked about last week was that we were doing the pandemic unemployment assistance update for people who are self-employed or certain W-2 employees. Um, we were matching that information with available tax data, and um, about 6,000 people were able to match uh, and saw an increase in benefits. Uh, as you may remember, the um, benefit was $172 a week. Everyone was receiving that. Um, the average increase for the folks uh, who we had data available for was about $143 a week. So that would bring up their benefit to about $315 a week. Um, you can continue to um, upload tax documents. We started doing that earlier this week. Uh, and there's a guide online that will walk you through that. We also have a how-to video online as well. Um, and uh, so uh, we are beginning to see people uploading that data. And at this point, I know someone had asked a question about, about how long will it take. At this point, we're estimating that it'll take us somewhere from our normal, within our normal processing time frame of about 10 days to two weeks to, to process that information. Um, but we can get back to you next week when we've had more experience with the program as well. Um, and provide additional information. So um, I see it's always challenging for me because I can't really read what the, is in the chat box, but so, well, let me read this one. Um, so we're receiving inquiries from constituents who are getting confused because they think they're waiting to hear and then it turns out they were denied, but they insist they never received the denial or the notice to appeal. Is there flexibility to appeal, particularly in places where the claimant has reached out to MDUL through their legislators during the window of appeal, um, but never heard back? I think we have the ability to extend beyond the 15 days for good cause, and the, the staff in the Division of Administrative Hearings would want to talk with the individual about what happened. We would want to verify that we have their mailing address correct, that we have their email address correct, and to see what happened with the letter. Um, but each is on a case-by-case -case basis, and so I, it's difficult to say whether or not we can um, issue it. We, we certainly can't issue a, a blanket statement that that would be allowed. Um, is number three missing a not on the work search questionnaire? Looks like the, the lock on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, we're still we're still uh, tweaking this, so I appreciate the editing there. Again, that screen is not going to be available until Sunday, August sixteenth. Correct. Is there other questions? Um, Commissioner, um, my name is Ann Matlack. I'm uh, on the phone. I'm afraid that there's chaos in my house and I can't get on the video. Um, I have a question with regard to um, the PUA. I had a constituent say that they had been on there and they had been um, filing claims. And this week when they filed, they had um, a, a little bit of income and it shut down their uh, form that they were, were unable to get through the form and they kept trying in different variations to try and report 
um, but they were unable to. Is this unique or is this something that's a problem? It, it, it sounds, as I say, it's not something that I've heard of that there's been an issue reporting income, um, yeah. e either on the, you know, the income with an employer or the income through the odd job. Um, this is a, you this want, a self-employed person? Right, so on the weekly certification, someone who is self-employed would report any, any of their gross income under the, the odd jobs question. Okay. So if you wanted to uh, just uh, get back to us offline with the name of the person, we could check into it and yeah, see if there's definitely. anything. And uh, they should be able to report their income. Uh, where I thought you were headed was if they had earned more than their um, maximum weekly benefit, they would not receive a benefit for that week. Um, so I know that sometimes, particularly as people are starting to go back to work, uh, they are surprised. Um, you know, for example, uh, if the person was receiving uh, PUA, pandemic unemployment assistance, and they were receiving the uh, regular weekly benefit uh, of $172, if they earned more, than $177 that week, they would not receive an unemployment benefit for that week. Right, that, that may be a problem with them, that may be the issue, but she couldn't get through the entire report. Yeah, that, that's something that we should check into, but we're not aware of any sort of uh, system-wide issue with that. Okay, um, how, do I, how do I get in touch? Do I send you an email? Sure. I will do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, Commissioner. Uh, Mo Terry, I uh, represent Gorham. Um, I, um, I think I had mailed in a question to my, um, to my aide, but maybe it, maybe it didn't get through to you guys. We have um, had some folks that, well, actually one, one of my folks in particular uh, got the call for his fact-finding mission, but wasn't available to answer the phone. And so his claim was denied. Um, and now he's got a file for an appeal. Um, that sounded a little suspect to me. Like uh, I thought that they were supposed to be getting uh, notifications in the mail prior to the phone call happening. Um, but he tells me that he did not get that, um, that notification. So I guess my question to you at this point is how long does the appeal process take, you know, as an, on its most simple basis, like say nothing goes wrong. <laughs> um, how long is this gentleman going to need to wait before he starts getting benefits? Well, first of all, I mean, let's look at uh, first he, make sure he files the appeal. So yeah, just yeah. make sure you do that because you've got a 15-day window um, in order for that to happen. Yeah. I think the other thing we can look at is, uh, as uh, the Deputy Commissioner said, is to make sure that we have the correct contact information uh, for him. And um, if you wanted to, uh, to get us that information, we'll verify it. But please make sure he files the appeal uh, okay. first. Um, with the expedited process, what we're doing as well, and I'm just wondering um, whether or not, uh, I, I hear you saying he, he was denied because he didn't, uh, wasn't available for the fact finding, which could be true. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, we, we, would, we would not deny simply because someone right. didn't participate. Yeah. If, so, so that's what he was. He was told that by he was told that by um, uh, the person that he talked to at DOL right after he realized what had happened. Um, he was told that it was denied because he didn't answer the phone. <laughs> yeah, that's not. I mean, that's not a that's not a stand. Which is why let's talk offline about it. Yeah. Please have him file okay. appeal. Um, okay. And even with our, our expedited process, what we do is we would be looking at information. Um, if, you know, let's say someone has a, the example that we put up on the screen earlier, um, an August 28th uh, fact finding. Um, by working through things more quickly, we may be able to deal with it today. 
So okay. today I may pick up the phone and call and say, okay, Kim, my name is Laura Fortman, Director of Labor. You know, I want to hold the fact finding. Um, and if Kim is not home or says, I'm not ready to have this, what I would do is I would send by um, U.S. Postal Service a date and time five days from now, because we're mm -hmm. required to give people five days, we would send it to them in the mail um, okay. and say, like, whatever, next Thursday or Friday at 10 o'clock, um, your fact-finding has been scheduled, and we usually say keep an hour before and an hour after. So it's really, it's like a three-hour window. So if I say 10 o'clock, could, I could call you at 9 o'clock and I could call you at 11, but it's within that that three-hour window that I would be calling. But you should have, the claimant should have some sort of documentation that's, that uh, gives the time even on this ex, through this expedited process. And I also okay. wanted to add, so if, if we try during that 9 to 11 o'clock window and are unable to get the individual, um, the message is to please call back within 48 hours. Oh, okay. So after, okay. So after a five-day notice, after and then another 48 hours, we would issue the determination based on the information that we have. Right? Okay. All right. But not, Terrific. Not simply because someone did not participate. And Excellent. that callback is um, is that person's phone number, so it's not the 800 number that they're calling back. Oh, great. Because okay. I know okay. that's the other question. So so that's why um, <laughs> you know it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it's. It, it, if it did, we it was not supposed to. <laughs> Got it. Right. Okay. Not our normal, let's just say it would be outside of our normal process. Okay, terrific. That's good to hear. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Are there other questions? If not, um, thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy uh, the, the rest of your uh, Friday afternoon, and hopefully have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.